Bibles are in the chair. Two Bibles to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5. We read starting verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I put in your bulletin this morning some optical illusions that you're probably looking at maybe before the service started today. They, uh, I put them there just to prime your mind a little bit and get us thinking about this. Uh, they show us how a mind can perceive one thing when in reality uh, something actually different is there. For example, the four figures there on the right are the same size although they look like they're different sizes. These are all well-known optical illusions. You, they've been in encyclopedias forever, and you can find them on the internet, which is where I found them, and put them in. They're all, they're all very interesting. And the, the, they, they look like they're different sizes because the background kind of deceives our mind and our, and our eyes. The, uh, the two tabletops in the lower right uh, are my, my favorite one, because they are exactly the same size and shape although they look different because of the placement of the legs and we think that they're three-dimensional, so we think that they, they are different. The others, is that a frog or is that a horse? Depends how you hold the paper here. See? Uh, is that a rabbit or is that a duck? Is that a swan or a squirrel? It's all a matter how you look at it. It's a matter of perspective. And I put these out here uh, just to... to introduce the fact that that's true in the spiritual life as well. There's a shift in perspective that happens when one orients one's life around Christ, etc. From the perspective of Christ, we see everything from a different point of view. We see things from a spiritual perspective rather than a worldly perspective. The Apostle Paul sums it up in our passage in this way. He writes, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Now, I normally read the text from the New King James Version that I like. I decided I had to go with a different translation this time. The New King James uses the phrase, according to the flesh, in this past, instead of from a human point of view. And according to the flesh, it's actually a more accurate word-for-word uh, -word translation. But it's hard to understand, because you have to understand, because you have to know that Paul's uh, used the word flesh. That does not mean body. You have to get into that whole thing. That's why I decided to use this particular translation that, that says, from a human point of view. Paul talks about viewing Christ from a human point of view and viewing others from a human point of view, from, from a spiritual point of view. So we talk about Christ first. Viewing Christ from a human point of view means to see him no differently than any other human being. To see Jesus simply as a human who lived 2,000 years ago. Now some people would not even go that far. There are very few historians who question if there ever was a man named Jesus. <coughs> they say that the character of Jesus was made up by the early church. 
that he was really a mythological figure that was created from motifs, from other myths. But that view is rejected by the vast majority of serious historians. It's just too much evidence that it's too early to think that the figure of Jesus is pure fiction. 99% of historians acknowledge that Jesus of Nazareth really lived, that he died by crucifixion at the hands of the Roman authorities in Jerusalem somewhere around the year 30 AD. Furthermore, they acknowledge that the Gospels contain his words, but that's about as far as historians go, because the discipline of historical science rules out the supernatural, the theological, or the metaphysical. So it can say nothing about whether Jesus is the Son of God. It cannot talk about the virgin birth. It can't talk about the resurrection of Jesus from the grave on Easter, or the miracles of Jesus, or anything like that. It cannot say anything about any spiritual significance that might be in the crucifixion of Jesus. The parameters of the academic discipline of historical science rule out the discussion of such things. It sees Jesus purely from a human point of view. And that is the way that many people see Christ today, from a purely human perspective. Consequently, people will see Jesus as just one of many human religious teachers in history. Every culture has its religion or religions and founders of those religions, China had Confucius, and India had Buddha, and Arabia had Muhammad, and ancient Israel had Moses, and then later Israel, under Roman occupation in Palestine, had Jesus. The human point of view says that these are all the same type of historical phenomena, that they are all religious teachers, that their teachings <coughs> might be different, but they're also very much the same, these religions, insofar as they involve worship and ethics and ritual. That's the human point of view. That's the secular perspective. It is the, the dominant perspective, point of view, in Western Europe and much of America. We even see this influencing people uh, who consider themselves spiritual. They'll uh, look at all these religions and these religious founders of the world and, and decide uh, that they're pretty much the same, uh, with minor cultural differences. That they're basically saying the same thing. That's the human point of view. The Apostle Paul says, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. As Christians, we view Christ from a different point of view. Now, what is different? What has changed? Christ has not changed. History has not changed. The facts have not changed. What has changed? We have changed. He says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The difference, you see, is being in Christ. And I like the old King James language here. That says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. When we are in Christ, we are different creatures, and everything else is different and is seen different. Everything has become new, it says here. We change our perspective on the world, and our perspective on the world changes when we change. We look at the optical illusions, and suddenly we see what we never saw before, like that one that I skipped over when I was showing you on the top left there about, about the tiger. It was a little bit harder to see because it's kind of small here and it's, it's not in color. First we just see the tiger and then suddenly if we look hard enough we see the hidden tiger. I don't know if you can see the hidden tiger. It's easier when it's bigger. It's written in the stripes of the, of the tiger. You know, in the same way we see, in a similar way, you know, we can say that we see Jesus, the man, but then our eyes are opened and we see Jesus, the Son of God. We see things not just humanly, but spiritually and theologically. And Paul deals with both the spiritual and the theological aspects of our passage here. 
I want to deal with the spiritual first because it is more experiential, and I find that people are much more interested in, in spirituality than theology, even though both, both are important. When we, when we see ourselves as the only human, then we see Christ as only human. When the Holy Spirit awakens us to the spiritual dimension of the universe, what Jesus called the born of the Spirit, then we see everything, including ourselves, and including Christ, from a new perspective, because we are a new creation, a new creature. You could say we're no longer just homo sapiens, but we are homo spiritus, you know, a spiritual creature. We have that spiritual depth and dimension to us. So we see Christ not simply as a simple, superficial human, but as deeply divine, a spiritual son of God. Now here, when I'm talking about this, I'm not just talking about a change of mind, even though thinking is definitely part of it. This is where the optical illusion metaphor breaks down. You know, there's a, these are fun little tricks on the mind and on the eyes, but they don't do anything. They don't change our lives. But I'm talking about a shift that changes. I'm talking about a change of heart, and a change of soul. So that we are more than just physical animals living out a few decades on this earth. We know intuitively that we are more than that. We are aware of a bigger cosmic, if you will, dimension to our lives. I've quoted Pierre Tehar de Shaddad before from his book Phenomenon of Man. He writes, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, but spiritual beings having a human experience. And this dimension is the source of the religious impulse in human beings. That is what gives rise to the spiritual search and gives rise to religion. When by the grace of God we look at Jesus of Nazareth, we see him not just from a human perspective as a, just another human, but from a spiritual perspective, as the divine Son of God, then it's the beginning of a transformation that Paul describes here. This insight into Christ is experienced as revelation. All of a sudden, we see it when we didn't see it before. It's a gift from God. And when we receive this insight, then we have a choice to make. We have to respond to the spiritual insight or not. We have to throw in our lot with Christ or not. That is about, that is faith. That is faith in Christ. Faith is not just believing something about Jesus. Faith is trusting Christ. Faith is not primarily about teachings. Faith is about commitment. By grace we are granted a glimpse of Christ's nature. By faith we act upon that revelation. Now many people experience God in various ways. But faith is more than experience of God or Christ. It takes a step beyond experience. Now, religious and spiritual experiences are wonderful, but that's not faith. Faith is designed to act on that new spiritual information. There are a lot of people, increasingly in recent decades, who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. But that phrase, what they usually mean is that they, they feel spiritual, but they just can't connect to religious organizations. They acknowledge a spiritual dimension, an impulse, or insight, or experiences that are meaningful. And this is often experience in connection with beauty, or nature, or art, or music, or some other experience. And that is wonderful. And that experience is true. And we all have had that experience. But that's just the beginning. That's just the vestibule, you could say, to the spiritual life. That's the lobby. Or to put it in New Hampshire terms, that's the mud room. We don't live in the mud room. That's where you take off your boots and hang up our coats. It is meant as an entryway to the living space of the house. Faith is stepping beyond the mud room into the spaciousness of God's mansion. Remember that famous passage where Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. The old King James says, Many mansions. We have to explore them all. 
and not be content with the mud rock. This brings me to the theological dimension. Theology is one of those inner rooms of God's mansion, and it's a wonderful room. I picture it as the library, with a wall with walls of bookshelves. That's where we sit down by the fire with our Heavenly Father, and we learn some things about the spiritual life and how Jesus fits into this. Paul talks about this in our passage as well. He says in verse 18 and following. He says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself, to Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, he says, since God is making his appeal to us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now there's a lot there. It's hard even to, to follow that when, when, you're, when you're reading it. A lot of theology there. Much more theology than I can talk about in the few remaining minutes of, 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 this, of this message. It's talking about righteousness there. But the main point that Paul is making here is reconciliation. He uses the word five times in these four verses. In Christ we have reconciliation with God. This is crucial to understanding Christ and the spiritual life. <clears throat> First we have to understand the need for reconciliation. And this is a big step for people. Because many people in our society don't see any need for reconciliation with God. You may have heard the old joke, evangelist asks the man, have you found Christ? And the man replies, I didn't know he was lost. <laughs> the same man as we ask the average person that we are talking to on the street, maybe the post office or something, if they were reconciled to God, they might respond, I didn't know we were, we were arguing. A lot of people don't know there's a problem. And so, of course, they're not looking for a solution. That this is why the Christian gospel doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people these days. Because it solves the problem that most people don't think they have. But I see it this way. I see it as like a person with cancer or heart disease, but don't know it. They're not thinking they have a problem because they don't see any symptoms, they don't feel sick. So they don't think they need a doctor because they don't think they have a problem. But they might have very high blood pressure, or they might have very high cholesterol, or they might have a tumor growing silently somewhere. And then one day, they rush to the emergency room with pain, or a heart attack, or stroke, or cancer is revealed. That is why it's so important on a physical level that we have regular medical checkups to monitor the invisible things that could kill us. Like the blood pressure or the cholesterol or mammograms or other cancer screenings. This is the way it is with spiritual health as well. Just because we aren't in immediate crisis doesn't mean everything's alright. But when we examine our lives in the light of Scripture, we might be surprised by the test results. Because I see Scripture as like an X-ray or an MRI or a CT scan. It looks deep inside us. Scripture reveals to us what we could never see with ordinary outward human sight. That there is a problem at the heart of human existence. And once we understand Scripture, then our human condition becomes clear to us. And we wonder how and why we never saw it before. It's like the optical illusions in the bulletin there. Once we see it, we wonder how we ever missed it. Once we hear the voice of God analyze our condition, then we can see and then we notice the symptoms that we missed. The symptom of the restlessness of the human heart. There is a search for security. There is a pursuit of happiness. Humans are always looking for something more. We're never satisfied. There's something that doesn't quite feel right in people's lives. We can't quite put a finger on it. And it manifests in many types of dissatisfaction 
with life. People are dissatisfied with family and how things are in the relationships or marriage or with jobs or with a financial situation. We never have quite enough money to feel really secure or, di or our dissatisfaction with government and politicians with the hope that the new candidate will be different. But he or she never is. We are dissatisfied with religion and with religious leaders and institutions and churches. We are not quite as healthy as we want to be. And even when everything seems to be going well, we wonder what will happen in the future. Nothing is ever exactly right. And even when it is, even when we get what we want, we seem to have it exactly the way we want things to be. After a while, we get restless again, looking for something more. These are the symptoms of a deep spiritual issue. Sometimes these symptoms can be quite acute in developing a mental illness, even result in suicide. I've been reading, as well, I'm sure a lot of you have been, about the debate going on about gun violence in America. And I saw a very interesting statistic in the article in USA Today, probably about a couple of weeks ago now. You know, everyone is all concerned about gun violence involving homicides and mass killings. But these statistics in their article said that almost twice as many deaths from guns are from suicide than from homicide. The average year at 19,000 gun-related deaths are suicide compared to 11,000 homicides. That means two-thirds of the times that gun is used to kill somebody, the gun is used to kill the person who owns the gun. You know, why are we not talking about that in this whole discussion? What does that tell us? It tells me there's a deeper issue here than legislation involving gun control or background checks. It shows that there is something in the human heart that needs to be addressed. The ancient Christian theologian Augustine put it this way, God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless to that they find rest in thee. The problems of the human heart are the signs of our need for peace with God and peace in God. That is what God did in Christ. <clears throat> Christ opened up the way for us to find rest in God. A passage says God reconciled us to himself, to Christ. It says in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And that's what the cross is all about. I could go into the theological details of how the cross accomplished this. This is important, and this is interesting, and I'm going to be exploring facets of that as we grow go get closer to, to Holy Week. But right now, in this message, it's not so important that we understand the theology, just as it's not so important that we understand the, all the scientific details of a type of cancer that we might have. What is important is that we find a physician who does understand it and can cure us of the cancer. That is what is important spiritually. Christ is the great physician who has the cure for the spiritual disease that we have. Christ is the physician, and, and he is the cure. Thanks be to God for the healing that he grants to us through Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, we pray that our eyes might be open. We know that we walk around our, our lives with tunnel vision that we just kind of ignore most of what goes on, especially the spiritual dimension of our lives. We just think everything is all right. We don't really deal with uh, those issues at the heart of our, of our soul, at the heart of our society, at the heart of our, heart of our species. Lord, we pray that the eyes of our hearts might be opened by your Holy Spirit. That we might see things as they really are. And that this might call us, might call us to, to come to you great physician, savior of our souls. Yes, it's in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.